I guarantee that no YouTuber has ever asked you this question before. Where are you watching this video from right now? If the answer is I'm in bed, well perhaps you need to pay attention to this video because I'm going to give you four strong warnings of why laziness is a sin. Number one, oversleeping is sinful. The Bible says, how long will you lie there, you sluggard? When will you get up from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come on you like a thief and scarcity like an armed man. Now, please don't misunderstand me. Sleep is a precious gift from God. And some of you might be asking the question, what about people who have health conditions? Maybe you're thinking, who is the most hard-working man who has ever lived? Well, I'm gonna answer those questions a little bit later. But first, for the rest of us, we have no excuse. You see, every single one of us needs to have mind over mattress. We need to remember that work is a great blessing and if any of us are cutting corners, if any of us are being lazy, if any of us aren't rising at a reasonable time and we're rolling around in bed, turning up to work late, know this, the Bible says, all of a sudden, you will lose your job. That has happened before. People all of a sudden have gone bankrupt as quick as a bank robbery because they'd rested on their former successes. They'd rested on the work they did before, but they didn't take the job and the position seriously that the Lord had granted them each and every day. Okay, let's just stop there for a minute and let us remember this. In the Bible, there is a Sabbath principle. We were not made to work constantly and never have a rest. No, our bodies need recharging. We need to get sufficient sleep. Why? Because we're not God. We're just made from the dust of the ground. And for us to think that we can keep working is actually an affront against the Most High God. Because we're saying we have the same energy as you when we don't. So let us remember, yes, sleep is a gift from God. But let none of us abuse this precious gift. And if you're abusing it, you know who you are and you're only doing a disservice to yourself because God created man and he put him in a garden to work. Because when we work, when we find our calling, when we have a purpose, that's actually when we're most happy. Number two, stop making excuses. Proverbs 26 verse 13, a sluggard says, there's a lion in the road, a fierce lion roaming the streets. This is almost comical, isn't it? You can imagine a boss ringing up one of his employees and saying, John, where are you? Are you coming into work today? Um, I'm sorry, boss. I just need to stay at home today. Why, John? Well, there's a lion in the road. A lion in the road. Yes, it's big and it's got big teeth and if I go out on the road, it'll devour me. Okay, John, okay, I, I get what you're saying. Shut the door, stay indoors and make sure you keep as far away from that lion. Anything you say, boss. Guys, we might be able to fool our earthly masters with excuses, with lies, but we will never be able to fool our heavenly master. Why? Because God will not be mocked. I did say to you that I wanted to talk to you about people who have good excuses, people who have health conditions. For instance, I know a lady who needs at least nine hours sleep a night because she's got rheumatoid arthritis. And on top of that, when she wakes up in the morning, it can take her almost two hours to get out of bed because her body is so stiff, because her joints are so inflamed. So perhaps that's you. Perhaps you feel tired all the time. You're worn out, your body is weak. And if you're listening right now and you have got a condition, you need to hear these words. You're not lazy and God loves you and he's with you through this pain. But maybe you don't know you've got an underlying health condition. And if you are feeling tired or depressed, I really want to encourage you, go to the doctors because this could be fixed with just a simple change of nutrients or a bit of help. So what do I mean by making excuses? I'm talking about the man or the woman who is always playing the blame game. Let me tell you about someone who never made excuses. You know the story well, Joseph was sold into slavery by his own brothers, betrayed. And then he finds himself in a rich man called Potiphar's house. And Potiphar starts to give Joseph a job. And as Joseph works that job, he excels, he works hard. So then Potiphar raises him up higher and puts him in charge of all of his things. And everything that Joseph's hands touch, it prospers. 
because the Lord was with him. But then there was a woman who took a liking to Joseph. It was Potiphar's wife. And she kept saying, come lie with me, Joseph. Come lie with me. But Joseph fled away because he was an honest, righteous man. But what was his reward? He got falsely accused. And where did Joseph find himself? He found himself in the depths of a dark Egyptian prison. And instead of complaining, instead of playing the blame game and saying, God, is this how you repay me? Is this how you repay me for being a good man, a righteous man? Here I am in prison. No, what did Joseph do? He worked. And as Joseph touched other things in this prison, it began to prosper until he was in charge of all of the prison because he worked despite being around the darkness. And God took him out of the darkness, took him out of the depths, and raised him to the heights, to the point where he became the president over Egypt. My dear friend, let us be like Joseph. Even when we're in darkness, even when we've been wronged, even when we're in a difficult situation, let us work for the Lord that our light might shine before all men. Number three, the third warning against laziness is the private always becomes public. Let me tell you something. You show me any man in the world who's achieved something big for God, and I'll show you a man who has lived a life of sacrifice. It's true, isn't it? The man who wakes up early every morning, the woman who spends so much time seeking the Lord's face. When she goes out into the real world, there's a light that radiates, that beams from them. Because just like Moses, when he saw the glory of God, people could see his face was shining. So we can tell when a man or woman has spent a lot of time in quiet looking for the Lord. But on the flip side, however, we can also smell a fake a mile off. It's so easy to see the man who pretends that he's holier than everyone else. But really you think, no, you're just putting on an act. It's really clear, isn't it, to everyone to see the person who, when the boss enters into the room, he pretends he's working, but as soon as the boss turns his back, he goes back to being lazy. And eventually, it's even easy to spot the person who has been living a life of secret sin. They're harboring some indulgent pleasure, and they think it's in private, they think no one can see, but because they spend so much time absorbing these things, it radiates out from them. And Jesus did say, didn't he? Anything that has been hidden will one day be revealed. So let that put a spike of fear inside us that we are so careful what we absorb. And let us make sure above all that we do not seek the pleasures of this life, especially when we're supposed to be working. Oh friends, at one time the church used to be known for its sacrifice, but today the church is known for its silence. What has happened to us as Christians? What has happened to the Spurgeons who used to labour every single day in the Word of God, who at the same time as managing a Bible college, being the principal of a Bible college, he could minister to a church and write sermons? What happened to the John Wesleys who would spend months and months on the road, on horseback, riding for many miles, preaching the gospel in the open air while people threw dead bits of cat and brick at him. What happened to the George Whitfields, who in one week would preach 28 times? And is it any wonder that tens of thousands of people would turn up to hear him preach? My dear friend, these people, they laboured for the Lord, and because of their labours to this day, in the 21st century, we're still reaping the benefits from their ministry. I don't know a preacher who can preach better than Spurgeon. I don't know a preacher who's more inspiring than John Wesley. These men knew what it was to labour for the Lord, and God bless their work. Do you want to be a man totally devoted to the Lord God? Do you want to be a woman who gives everything and everyone knows that this woman loves the Lord God more than anything else? Well, if you do, you need to take up your cross and not your cushion. Some of you, you need to switch that Xbox off. Some of you, you need to put social media away for a full month. And some of you, you need to get accountability software on your computer. And the fourth and final warning to the lazy person is you need to remember you haven't got as long as you think. The Bible says, as long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. 
You don't need me to tell you that night is coming. You don't need me to tell you that the candle is getting thinner and thinner. So none of us, none of us, when we are given by God 24 hours a day, can afford to waste one hour. We cannot afford to procrastinate because one day, unless the Lord comes, you might just be that old woman sat in an old people's home. You might just be that old man reminiscing on his patio, looking out at the life he could have had. And there in your hand will be the dreams that you wish you were able to fulfill. Only you can be the godly father to your son. Only you can be the godly mother and teach your daughter the Bible. Only you can write that book, that burden that God has put on your heart. Only you can have the voice to share the gospel with your neighbours. Only you can live out that vision, that calling that the Lord God has placed on your life. And unless today you take that window of opportunity, unless Unless today you jump through that season of life that is here today, but tomorrow will be gone. Well, you'll sit there with regret, knowing that those dreams will die with you. They'll be buried with you because no one else can fulfill them but you. So, here's the point you've all been waiting for. Who is the most hard-working man that has ever lived? Well, if you're still with me now, if you're proven to me that you're not a lazy person, you've put the time in to watch this video, just see if you can write the answer down in the comment box and then I'll know you're still with me. But I'll tell you, the answer is found here in John chapter 4, verse 34. The Bible says, My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. So who's the hardest working man that ever lived? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. He was always about his father's business. He was always working hard. There was points when he was so busy that he was too busy that he couldn't eat. He, yes, at times he said, come aside and rest a while, but he always made sure that he never wasted an hour. He spent time in prayer. He spent time feeding the poor. He spent time healing the sick. In fact, one of the most beautiful passages in all of the Bible for me is when that blind man, he could hear the crowds. He could hear the Messiah is nearby. So what did he do? He called out and said, son of David, have mercy on me. And the people said, shh, be quiet, blind man, be quiet. But he cried all the louder, Son of David, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus heard that blind man's cries. And when all the crowds were around him like a celebrity, he took time out of the busyness of his day and he got down next to that blind man and made that blind man see. Jesus was never too busy for people. Can I ask you a question? Are you too busy for people. And not only was Jesus a hard worker as a carpenter, but he also completed the hardest job, the hardest task. He completed the finished work on the cross, where in his body, there he took the weight of our sin. All the world's sins, all the people who've ever lived in this world, all of their sin was, if you like, scrunched up into one big ball and placed on Jesus Christ. And there the Christ, the savior of the world, died so that we might be forgiven. And when that work was completed, what did he cry out? Those three words, it is finished. I've done it, Father. I've completed the task that you asked me to do. I've died for sinners and now there is a salvation to any who call on my name. To any who call out to me, I will save them, I'll forgive them and I'll give them eternal life. That is the most beautiful message. Yes, we're to work hard at our jobs. And yes, the Bible says we're to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. But there is no good work that we can ever do to earn our salvation. God never says, oh, you've been a good boy, Joe. Here, you can have salvation. You've been a good girl, Emma. Here, here's your salvation. No, we don't contribute any works of ourselves. We rest in all of the work that Christ has done. And I think that is a beautiful thing to dwell on because Joe Kirby hasn't got any good work to give to God, but Christ Jesus certainly has. We've only scratched the surface on how important time is. And some of you, you need to hear this message because I think it'll wake you up. I'll see you over there. And if you haven't yet subscribed, please do consider subscribing. I really do want to see you again. God bless you all and thank you for watching.